Hello. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so you can start uh, when uh, you are ready, when you want. Okay. All right. So, uh, well, I start presenting myself. Um, I'm Anna Gamboa. I'm a fifth year PhD student at here at uh, Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. And uh, my main research is about the relationship between uh, international trade and international human rights law. Uh, I found it uh, very interesting and I hope you will find it uh, as well. Um, so without further ado, I'll just start talking about my, my paper. So yes. Yeah, um, no, I'm just thinking, okay. Um, just go ahead. Um, I think what I will do is have both of you present though, because Ivy may want to drop off the call before 2.45 in the morning. Ah, I, well, I, I, if I yeah, want so. to. Um, so why don't uh, we just go ahead, go ahead. Just, okay. Have fun. Um, I can, I can probably, uh, the best idea will be just summarizing a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And if, you, um, and if you have further questions about something specific I said, then uh, then we can just uh, talk about it. So my main research is about a, a kind of estrangement between um, uh, two international laws. And I, in, in my paper, I talk about that this estrangement, estrangement is the consequence of uh, two post-war uh, failures. And uh, when I talk about post-war failures, I'm referring that after the Second World War, there was the idea of creating an international trade organization. Um, this was uh, a project that developed in parallel with another one. And the other one was the creation of an international bill of rights uh, because of the politics and uh, a lot of uh, controversies of that time, both projects failed in the sense that uh, neither the international trade organization was created. Instead, it was um, the, the, the GATT took its place. And in the area of human rights law, um, it was not creating a binding document, but it was uh, the, the main project was divided in three, which was a declaration, a covenant and, and measures for implementation. And uh, in the first step, what was the uh, declaration that we know as Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we know that uh, it wasn't binding. And then the covenant was divided into separate covenants, weakening one uh, and, and weakening the, the, the main uh, power, if we can say it like that, of human rights law. And the measures of implementation are still, um, they are still developing. So because of these two, two post-war projects, my argument here is that the whole international order has been weakened and uh, in somehow it has been unable to respond uh, a, a threat such as uh, the pandemic in a way that it should have. Because it, uh, why I said it has been weakened because these two uh, international institutions that should have been developing after the second world war were meant to, um, to attain an overlapping purpose which was the creation of, um, of economic stability and well-being for all. Because of this estrangement, then uh, the UN hasn't been able to actually achieve this overlapping purpose. And this will be a very brief uh, introduction. I, I think you you have to unmute your. Um... So, <laughs> how how should we proceed? Like, should I do an introduction or? Um. What should I, should I also give an introduction or I just go ahead with the presentation? Sorry. I think you, you have to unmute your uh, microphone. Oh, it's already, um... oh, sorry. I was, I, was like, <laughs> I was sitting there. Okay. So yes, please give an introduction. Um, let's treat this kind of the way that you would if you were on um, giving a job talk on Zoom. Oh, that's a. Uh, but we can be we can be much less formal uh, in our discussion. <laughs> oh, so um, my my paper is about um 
methods. I use a, a quantitative method to investigate the relationship between judicial independence and economic growth in China. And, and the data cross on uh, cross province data, cross provincial data in China. So um, hmm. that is the general topic. And that research has a general general background, or I'd say it fits the general literature about um, uh, Western literature about uh, um, the conducive effect of judicial independence on economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the Western world, there are uh, several, uh, fam there were several famous uh, um, empirical literature on, on that aspect. And then there's this, uh, there, there's this general belief uh, now, in uh, qualitative belief that judicial independence is essential to economic growth, and I found that uh, China's experience does not fit this uh, conven conventional wisdom. So that motivated me to to empirically test it using Chinese data from Chinese provinces. Uh, I used a I'd say like very simple statistical tool that's a, a Spearman and also Pearson correlation testing relationship between judicial like different judicial independence factors uh, relationship co correlation with uh, GDP growth rate in China between um, it's between 2000 and like in the most recent, recent five decades, sorry, decades. So through through this uh, test, I found that there is a, I cannot find any correlation between judicial, those judicial independence factors and China's economic growth rate. And parallel to that, I found that uh, uh, if I test the China uh, economic growth against uh, some uh, established uh, um, variables that's been deemed um, conducive to economic growth uh, in the economics world, I find that uh, only education, educational attainment, and uh, initial GDP has uh, is correlated with the economic growth rate in Chinese. Uh, by using Chinese province data. So uh, from this simple study, I, I don't want to say that I refuted the, the general conventional wisdom like in the, uh, by, by other scholars uh, uh, using cross-country data. But I think it uh, shows that China might be, China might be a special case in it, in the sense that the conventional wisdom that judicial independence uh, is conducive to economic growth might not uh, not apply to China, and that is not so surprising because uh, previous uh, studies, uh, although they are cross country and a lot of country included in their study. Actually, in some major study, China was not included in their data set. So um, that also uh, reminds us that, well, not just China, maybe there are some other non-traditional um, non uh, Western countries that's also been left out in, in some worldwide study. And that might uh, cause that the conventional wisdom doesn't fit the some part of the some countries in the world so well, and um, so I call for like more new study in in countries uh, like China and other you know no uh, non liberal democracies. I'd mm -hmm. like to say yes, uh, absolutely. That um, that's a that's a really that's a growing area. So so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I like the methodology and the general idea I used in my my paper. But I think the paper, you know, the resolution mm -hmm. due to the um, the the sample size in this uh, 
in this study, and also some limitation in, you know, in, in terms of uh, data quality. So I think the resolution is not very high. Okay. But, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, all right, so do you want to explain further? Sorry, I feel like I might have accidentally cut you off. It's really hard on Zoom sometimes. Uh, I, I think that's, a, maybe I can just like, you can ask questions. I, I'm not sure like sometimes, um, I think you, you read the paper, but like yes. not, and now so. All right, so we will try to workshop. Um, uh, and there may be some limitations and we do not have to go the entire time. Okay, so first question for both of you is what do you want comments on? How can I be helpful? What stage are these at? Um, sure. Well, um, I believe that uh, the comments that I would like to will be um, if if when I said that there was a failure, whether um, it is clear that I'm talking about uh, something that happened in the past, or do you think that I'm talking about a, a current? failure of the international institution? Because I think that uh, what I'm, well, first I would like to, to know your answer. I <laughs> know um, I read it, I read it uh, the first way and I, what I read you as arguing was arguing that there was an initial failure to link um, economic rights with economic development and a link uh, social and like basically the link um, political rights and economic development, and then also economic rights and economic development, right? There's a sort of attempt to chunk things off to appease uh, certain players in the early UN. Mm -hmm. And that that has led to sort of structural weaknesses in the rights regime um, that reverberate today and make it a less use, make it like that regime a less useful one, right? Okay. Than it could be, <laughs> um, and then I was also wondering, like, if you wanted comments on presentation style and on, um, like, you know, because I know Anna, for example, you're pretty far along in your program, and you're planning to be on the market soon. I don't know, Ivy, what whether you're in the same boat. Uh, kind I of, could do that I, too, or I could I, just talk about paper. Sorry. <laughs> I yeah, I'm. I'm uh, let's see. So I've already found a, a postdoc job, but they didn't do you know that kind of job talk interview. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, def, I definitely want to hear about uh, general comments and suggestions oh. uh, on how to gave you like a short nutshell about my paper. All right. Um, <laughs> I think in the interest of time, because it is 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, would it be okay if we, even though Anna, you presented first, if we did Ivy's paper first, so if, if she has to yes, go of course, at some point, please. because like we, we just don't want you to be totally exhausted here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so both of them were, were, um, really interesting and i i really liked so sort of general comments for both of you um it, i can tell like you're in common law programs right because the way that you write in terms of reaching an english language audience is very good it's a it's we, we call a queen's point first writing right you put your argument up front you structure the paper around proving that argument and I know that that is not the style that you need to use, for example, for continental European audience, but it is the style that you use in English language journals and you've both adapted to that style. So that I thought was, um, you know, very good. Assuming you wanna publish in English, you wanna potentially work, work in English. And I appreciate that that requires a lot of adaptation. Um, and I also think that the papers are, are really good to talk about together because they're both talking about similar things. They're talking about the relationship between economic development 
and uh, either a broader or in Ivy's case, a narrower conception of, of like some sort of political, political structure. Um, and as you're focusing on rights, Ivy, you're focusing more on structural issue, the judiciary that isn't necessarily tied to rights, uh, but it's a similar question. And so I think that we can hopefully get a conversation going between you. There may be some sources that you can share with each other as well. And I didn't know that you didn't have the papers. So that may be a little bit harder, but um, we'll do our best because it's a pandemic and your organization is being run by a bunch of pre-tenure women with children. So this is what happens. Um, whee! But that's also what makes it awesome because like we, we actually can all do this. Um, so I thought this was an interesting study and I have some methodological questions and also some comments on how you represent the literature. So the methodological question um, that I will start with, is, the big one is, um, I would put something explaining why you use numbers, right? If you, if you are trying to do like a broad study, it makes sense to use numbers. Um, so, you're using numbers because you're responding and you're responding to other literature that does. You're responding to law and economics literature that does, right? Is that, that's the motivation. And in terms of GDP um, measures, I'm gonna be less good because this isn't, I'm not really a, a law and economics person, but make sure that you have that locked down in terms of why you chose those measures. Um, what, what do you mean? Like, why do you choose those measures? You mean the specific, um, like the variables um, for variable. Like, are you taking them? Are they coming out of previous literature that's used them? Mm -hmm. And that's why you're using them. Okay. Yeah, that this is like, you know, it's not that you're you're saying these are the best variables to use for economic growth if you're responding to this conversation that's already going on. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get it. Um, and then I, on terms of the World Bank uh, model, so as you've no doubt uh, found when you went into this, the World Bank uses a lot of different, different parts of the World Bank use different measures of what an independent judiciary is. Right. There's the doing business reports. Um, there's this longer report that you reference. And some of the things that are referenced here are sort of older, for example, than the newer doing business reports. And so one question would be why you chose that branch of the World Bank and its definition versus the yearly doing business reports definitions or some other branch of the World Bank. Um, there's sort of an internal war over, over uh, how to define these things. And then there's also all the external criticism they're getting, right? There's a lot of criticism of using quantitative measures of um, rule of law to begin with. So, and you, and you reference some of that, right? You reference Ralph Michaels. Um, so I would say like explain why, you know, if you're gonna go back to the 2003 strategic report why mm -hmm. and how would it you might want to drop a footnote in there about how it would be different if you used a different branch of the world banks and i keep i keep saying the doing business reports why because they've been talked about and criticized in the comparative literature so i think it's something that a lot of people will go to who maybe are may, not like super deep in this area is like oh world bank doing business reports and that's not what you're referencing here Mm -hmm. um, so that would be just in terms of like choosing, choosing literature, um, and so yeah, a question for you is why use, why use these particular measures from the World Bank? Would you like to 
explain why, like how you selected those measures. You asking me? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, I when I decided to choose these measures, I actually it's under the assumption that uh, the exact definition of judicial independence is um, the the exact definition of what is judicial independence is not that important. I'd like to um, use the broadest kind of definition as broad as possible so that I can cut cut it into you know more uh, I can divide it into more factors hmm. and that, those factors are uh, can correspond to whatever data I can have. And it happens that the, the judicial, judicial independence data from uh, China Justice Index, mm -hmm. they, they have those, um, those, um, those questions, those ver or I'd say those variables. So it can, can fit the, okay. it's like, it's like, like the, what's that, that, that type of definition from that piece of literature just fit my, Existing data. Okay, and so, so like that's a, that. yeah. Did, so did, it's, did, it's a practical. Yeah. Um, so did China Justice Index base its questions on any of the international index index indices? <laughs> I can talk. I. They didn't say that. They copied their methodology from. Uh, what justice index from world justice index so why yeah. did you not does the world so that's a world justice project is that what they're yeah about? yeah right yeah. so they they kind of they the china the chinese version the china Justice index uh, um use used uh, the what justice project their index as a um, okay and model. so then but you oh i have sarah ross in the waiting room <sighs> um so you wanted to um you wanted to choose a different measure though than the one i don't know i should know but i don't off the top of my head whether the world justice project has a judicial independence index no no they don't have they have um uh, they have index about different judicial qualities okay and but, but not in my paper but, but right right uh, not yeah. not related so and another thing since um not everybody has the paper if you could maybe highlight for us what provinces you focused on and why Uh, what's the second half of your question? Sorry. Just uh, which ones you selected and why? Um, and what was your interesting findings um, in terms of provinces? Why do you think that? And if so, you know, why was there that variation? What provinces I found interesting? Yeah. Um, well, promise I found input, but that's just the in relation to like data quality or just like the, the distribution of data, but not not really relates to the research question, the big question I want to answer in my my paper. So so I'm not sure like you want to. Well, I'm wondering, for example, there's been a lot of emphasis in mm -hmm. Eastern, you know, on the East major eastern cities on um the quality of the judges and the quality of their prior legal education etc um and part of that emphasis at least to me has seemed to be around the idea that promoting economic growth requires these cities being sort of more outward facing in terms of trade like Shanghai, Beijing, Shandong, 
uh, if you look at the province of Shandong right there, are other there are cities in Shandong that are important for trade. And therefore, when we're talking about somewhere like Shanghai or Beijing, we need a higher quality judiciary. Um, and there, and so there might be some variation uh, in terms uh, of it, judicial independence between the provinces that are sort of more outward facing and there's been, been an emphasis on judicial quality as part of promoting China's economic development versus provinces that are more inward facing and perhaps there has not been the emphasis. Um, where did you get that, that idea? Sorry. Um, so there has, there's been, um, there's, so I've been reading some interesting stuff on um, Xi Jinping, the Xi Jinping government's um, focus on a, a, a type of judicial independence, right? On the idea that we need to make judges more independent from local control, mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. courts more reliable, more responsive mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. to the central government versus, mm -hmm. right? Oh, and so we'll get rid of local protectionism, which is something that foreign companies have complained about. Right, right. That's a, so that's, that's not from my paper. I, my, my paper actually doesn't touch this issue. I think what, what you just said and about uh, um, what China is doing, that's what they think. Mm -hmm. that's, um, that's what they think uh, would be good for doing business. Right. And I think that's, a, that's more consistent with uh, you know, the conventional wisdom, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so the question is whether, whether you see variation uh, I guess that some of these numbers are a bit but old. They're before that campaign and before the new mm -hmm. new circuit courts. Mm -hmm. um, but whether you see sort of pro province based variation that follows that or not. From from the correlation, you know, from my methodology, mm -hmm. uh, actually, you cannot you cannot find out, you know, uh, identify specific provinces that, you know, so basic my methodology cannot answer the, the question you, you asked. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, uh, if you use like all provincial data and then all judicial uh, economic growth data, you do correlation, you will only know whether A and B are correlated, related, okay. but I cannot tell like within the data set, like which uh, provinces or which data points like is more important than other like that. I, I don't think that the, my, my methodology cannot answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, right. I guess other um, people have jumped in, um, Vera and Sarah. Um, so we did have brief presentations. I don't know if you guys have read the papers and would want to ask questions. Um, we're basically treating it like a workshop for our two <laughs> presenters, so. Uh, no, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to, 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 to listen, so I wouldn't be able to contribute at this point. Okay. Um, let's see, I, and I've, I've been asking a lot of questions of Ivy, but um, I guess my other uh, question with this was, also, was sort of the CJI data and where that comes from. Can we talk a little bit more about what CJI is, who developed it, why? Um, there are some restrictions on gathering survey data in China. Um, but I understand that you can apply to have those restrictions waived. You know, knowing a bit more about the institution would, would get a sense of, of how it was able to do that work. Also, the CGI data is um, come gathered by, mainly by scholars from China, CUPL, China mm -hmm. University, 
uh, okay. political science and law. Right. So group, group scholars, they, they got a national, um, get a, 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 lot, a large sum of funding from the national level. So mm -hmm. that's part of uh, like a China has a government initiative called short, the short name is called like 20, 2011 plan. In, it's always named like that, but anyhow, so, so and, yep. yeah, like 2011, that's because it's a, it started in 2011. So CGI has a center called, uh, so kind of a, a judicial, a judicial uh, study center in located in CUPL. So they, uh, each year they, they sent out, uh, you know, students and research and researchers to all provinces and uh, do survey towards uh, uh, legal professionals, including judges, prosecutors, um, uh, lawyers and uh, police, policemen. And then also uh, ordinary citizens, like non legal professionals. So mm -hmm. they do two, may, many two, two types of uh, survey towards those people. And then they get gather the survey data. And those people, they, they use help. They hide a data processing agency for them, work to work for them for mm -hmm. data processing. So that's how they, they're doing it. And because they, they, they have they do have access to all these government uh, um, bodies yeah they, they still um I talked to them before I've talked to them before they said they even for them they sometimes get resistance from you know some some um, people from the the judiciary because right. the purpose for for the center to do this study is it's about doing the index and then they can compare like the, the quality of judiciary in different provinces. So people get pressure, like people in the system get pressure from their rankings. So they, that, that's a, um, and I think that kind of pressure uh, might to some, might compromise the quality of the, compromise the quality of the data if mm -hmm. if some province like if they didn't do well then they decided that uh, they they can ask like people to you know answer the question in in a certain way because they're asking people's they're tracking people's uh, perceptions of the judiciary right so you know yeah, and and do you think that that would be an issue where there's been the campaign to reduce local control, or do you see that as separate from the questions they're acting? So that at least that campaign wouldn't affect the answers to the survey. Um, I I don't think. I think like no matter whether they want to, no matter how much control the central government wants to have on like the local level judiciary, they always want to like rank high. So I, I don't think that. Yeah. And so you have, so we, we, so what we're comparing here is then province level data on GDP and province okay. level data on judicial independence according to the China Justice Index's rankings. Right, right. 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 And so one question is, oh, so I guess another question with this would be whether, you know, the judiciaries that have, the provinces with high GDP are doing that badly in CJI's own rankings. Right, because it might yeah. be that according to CJI, um, the Beijing judiciary is pretty professionalized and independent, which mm. I would expect, you know, it to, it to do well in those rankings in part because the mm. um, Beijing judges have been more influential in terms of setting judicial policy overall, mm -hmm. and then would also do well in terms of GDP because it's Beijing. 
Mm-hmm. But then there are also like some some provinces that they they're not very highly developed developed in terms of economy, and then they also score like really high in in CGI. So ah, interesting. So what, where can you point out some of those? Because some of it's a we're a little limited here by not all having the paper, but I. Yeah. I think I didn't like in the paper I I gave I sent you. It doesn't contain the the raw data, right? Like right. The, right. About like the CGI. Um. Just talk us through it since we're all we're you know pretend your audience is not read, which will be very true most of the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I. So, uh, three. Let me see. Um, I, I don't exactly remember. I think, like, as far as I recall, I think like Qinghai like ranked really high in some, and then Hainan. Mm -hmm. Hainan is a uh, yeah. Hainan was a uh, at some point becomes an outlier. Uh, for my uh, PSN analysis, so that, yeah, um, it ranked really high in in a certain year, and then like makes the data distribution not even normal anymore. So it oh, wow. changes the shape of the data distribution. Whoa. And um, I. I can speculate. Uh, well, maybe their their judicial quality is really good, right? Like, mm. but then at the same time, I speculate that they they decided to, you know, like I said yes. previous earlier on, like just to, you know, yeah. um, manipulate the survey. Right. We don't think of. of so, but I, yeah, yeah, but I, like <laughs> I, I don't know like exactly w which answer. Is the correct one, but anyhow, for from a statistical point of view, for uh, it's not suitable for using a Pearson test. Mm. So, in order to normalize my data, I eliminated that mm. particular data data set data point. Okay. So, so, so for that. Um, those were my questions about the paper. I have some comments as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that I, I see a question for Anna and then also I, but I, are you going to be able to stick around or will you need to go at some point before the cutoff because it's so late at night? Mm -hmm. I'll try to stick around like, uh, as, uh, as long as possible and uh, okay. anyway, at some point I'll just. All right, so then let's go to substantive questions for Anna and then I'll come back to both of you with some uh, writing comments. <laughs> um, so, uh, Vera, go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, I only had an abstract. Else, just raise your hand if you want to. Yeah. So, um, I only had an abstract that uh, I had a chance to read from you. And, and of course, I was uh, late for your presentation. So, you might have addressed this already. And, like, when I'm looking at the topic of your research, right? Um, uh, I'm wondering, like, what motivated you to choose uh, the comparison here? Because you know, international trade law for me it's a strictly public-to-public -public relations. International human rights creates, of course, uh, you know, rights to individuals, right? And so, um, uh, you have a question mark in the title itself, questioning whether they're siblings or distant relatives. I personally use them as distant relatives. So, can you explain how you combine them and what motivates you compare the two? And then I have more, you know, um, substantive question on the arguments that you are making. Yeah, that that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. I think that um, in in your question can be also the answer of that uh, because um, when I start looking into the historical um, legal his history of these two international laws I discovered that okay now we say like distant relatives but at the very very beginning of the uh, 
of the creation, if we can say it, of these two laws, that wasn't the uh, the case. And I think um, this is a uh, th this is the question: are, are they siblings or distant relatives? For sure, I think that now they are distant relatives. But I'm posing the question because at the very beginning, when they were born, they were siblings because they were created from a same legal root and. Um, although they were meant to work in a, in, in a specific area. For example, as you mentioned it, okay, trade was, uh, trade is something that is a public law between uh, countries and human rights are uh, between individuals and, and states. The main purpose of these two international law was to create uh, the conditions of stability and well-being, and together we're going to work in an overlapping purpose and they were not as separate as we say today, but the original purpose of these two laws comes from the UN Charter, where trade was uh, chosen as the best engine to promote this economic and social development. So um, yes, they are separate now, but uh, the, at the end of the Second World War, that wasn't that case. Yeah, and so... Um... I'll ask a few more questions if you don't yes, mind then, because I'm personally interested in a similar discussion, but with regard to international investment law, right? Uh -huh. And there, uh, uh, when it comes to how foreign corporations, for instance, behave in other foreign jurisdictions, uh, the question arises whether we should um, regulate, in effect, uh, the corporate behavior because the impact human rights, the impact labor rights abroad, etc. And uh, much of this regulation, it feels, comes from uh, what we call soft law, of course, in international yes. law, right? Uh, various guidelines and principles on OECD has stepped in, in into this field. And uh, um, I also see a new trend now in terms of uh, the treaty making and more and more you see um, bilateral investment treaties talking about human rights yes. as for instance, something that should be taken into account by corporate entities. And also I saw astonishingly there is this uh, model bilateral investment treaty that the Netherlands adopted last year when they actually not only proclaim the importance of uh, you know, corporate compliance rules, in international law, but also uh, invite arbitral tribunals to consider the corporate behavior as to human rights in particular, uh, when uh, uh, arbitral tribunals assess damages in case of investor state claims. And so it's not only, you know, um, on the front end, when the corporate entity comes to a foreign jurisdiction that human rights in particular is an important factor, but also we see what I call personally an attempt to enforce these rules um, through tribunal determinations at the back end of it. But I'm also a bit skeptical in a way, like uh, maybe this is my question to you. Um, so, okay, if I agree with you that they are siblings and <laughs> now I'm coming back to international trade law and human rights, what are the practical implications? How you can use or, um, um, you know, help these two areas of law maybe um, by realizing that they're siblings and that they have common origins? What does it give us? Yes, that's a great question. Um, actually, I think that um, when we talk about human rights in, uh, in a trade or investment approach, I am not saying that, um, that trade by itself, or, or let's say the World Trade Organization should start looking right now uh, on how to enforce those laws. Because uh, what I say that they are, they are siblings, they are not the same person, right? So in a, a different ambit of international law, they were worked, uh, mean, meant to work together. But the thing is that um, what I said is that part of the original purpose of the international trade law and also at, at that time uh, investment law was to create the condition of stability and well-being. So if you have an international law with that and purpose, then you, the whole vision of the uh, upcoming rules and articles and, and, and clauses, and if we call about a new trade agreements would include labor standards and also uh, rights to women and indigenous rights. Uh, all of that uh, 
comes from the what is the purpose of the international law? What is the purpose of this investment agreement? What is the purpose of, of the bids or of the trade organization? And if you change the perspective of that, those are separate laws, but there are uh, siblings working in the same purpose, which is the creation of economic uh, stability and the creation of well-being, then you can see uh, in a different way the results of those laws. Yeah, well, this is interesting because, you know, um, like from my perspective, uh, for me, it's easier to accept the uh, sibling nature of international investment law and human rights, for instance. I see how you can structure enforcement of, let's say, international investment law to take into account human rights violations by corporate entity. It's much harder to do it, it seems, when it comes to enforcement, when you talk about international trade law. So what do you do? You still have trade disputes, and now uh, you will take into account violations as, of human rights as part of these trade disputes. But those are different actors, and so I'm wondering, how do you, you know, foresee um, the enforcement of trade law, for instance, uh, with the view of the human rights uh, in particular? What could be done? Like, how can you? Uh, you well, know, if we think about take this uh, into account? Let's let's talk about the specific rights. First of all, I'll I'll have to say I'm talking here about uh, the failure of two projects, and it's not a, only a trade law but also human rights. And first, I'm going to ask, what do you think uh, human rights are? What are those rights? And if we go further, do you think that labor's rights are human rights? So if you are starting to include labor's rights, like fair labor standards within a trade agreement, then somehow you are talking about, uh, you are going into the area of human rights. And the interesting part of this is that in the original project of the international trade law, which was to create an international trade organization, fair labor standard was included in the trade charter. So uh, this is nothing entirely new. It was already uh, established or it was already discussed by, by the international community. And um, when all these uh, these uh, agreements and when the nations came together in order to create uh, this trade organization, it was not only about uh, labor rights, but for example, Mexico posed the question of, okay, what are we going to uh, do with migrants' rights? Or what are we going to do with this other stuff? So um, when, the, when the ITO was not created, all these other uh, ideas of, that should have been included in the trade law were left out of the trading system. And now we see it, uh, how they are trying to come back uh, in a way that uh, maybe some countries don't see it as human rights. For example, not all countries have uh, recognized the international covenant of economic and social rights and human rights. So my first question will be, what do you understand by, by human rights? And first by putting that uh, up front, then we can just go back and say, how are we, are we going to enforce and how are we going to implement those rights in the trade arena? Well, I'm, I'm willing to take the most expensive view, you know, and include labor rights in your human rights uh, discussion. But I'm just, um, I'm trying to figure out, you know, how to reconcile the two and uh, whether we need to do it. Because <laughs> I, for once, and uh, it's easier for me to draw international investment law, I, for once, um, I think there should be a limit and uh, otherwise we end up, uh, you know, having one single international law, so to speak. Um, you know, why not to use international human rights to address human rights violations and uh, then separately not to use international trade law to address trade concerns. But uh, I agree with you, it seems like there is a bit of uh, convergence here happening and uh, um, I wonder to myself, you know, whether we need to stop at some moment and let again human treaties deal with human concerns and human rights concerns, and then uh, let you know, let's say WTO system to address trade disputes. So, this is. You I know, completely agree with you. Um, when I I think about uh, these two, how these two. Uh, these two laws should converge. I absolutely not thinking that. Um, that for example, trade should be uh, uh, dealing directly with human rights violations. Those are separate laws, but uh, with an overlapping purpose. Of course, uh, human rights uh, will should, we should fix human rights law in order to make it its job and trade uh, in, in a way that 
if you just have trade, if you don't just have uh, economic or commercial laws without a boundary, what, what is the purpose of human rights? To create that uh, area where uh, you can do as much as you want, but protecting the dignity of the individual. So it's not that human rights will step into, it's not that trade law will step into the, into the human rights work, but if human rights does its work, then we'll be creating this boundary of action, this framework, this legal framework for trade actually uh, enforce its own trade laws, if that makes sense. It feels like you use uh, human rights and maybe I'm misinterpreting it as providing context to trade dispute. And so it's not necessarily that you wanna use um, you know, WTO dispute resolution, for instance, to somehow address human rights concerns, but you want in trade disputes um, have these concerns of other, you know, stakeholders involved. And so I think this is like, I interpret this as adding context. Um, I have other questions that I might ask, but um, I wonder if uh, I should pass the baton to Alisa for, for a moment and uh, see if anyone else wants to contribute. Um, this has been great. I actually just wanted to pick up um, on one of the threads from your conversation. Anna, where do you see this convergence coming from? Who's driving it and why? Um, I think that um, we can see the convergence in, in, uh, in history. Um, when the two post-war projects failed, it created a gap. And, um, and somehow, the international community has tried to bridge that gap, even if, if, uh, if they haven't realized that it was because of the post-war uh, projects. Um, but for example, um, in the uh, declaration of the, um, the right to development, uh, they were trying to reconnect economic uh, development with the enforcement of human rights. And that's what I talk about uh, a convergence is that the international community somehow is trying to fix this gap, this, uh, this uh, estrangement between economic development and human rights protections in a way that uh, they can go together. You cannot talk about just only economic growth with, without uh, taking care of human rights. And also you, in order to take care of human rights, you need a, a, a nation who, has, uh, who, who can have economic growth. So those should be uh, uh, working together. I'm wondering if we can be a bit more specific about the actors here. If you don't mind, um, just because I'm thinking there's like, for example, there are parties using human rights in economically related litigation and the, there are sort of cynical uses, right? Like, oh, you know, you can't, you can't make my state pay this many. I, I know more of the uh, arbitration side, right? Like you can't make us pay this much in damages for a bit violation because uh, we won't be able to fund schools and hospitals. Um, and, you know, or there's, um, parties that are, that are you, there's, that are using it as plaintiffs, right? Like wrapping up their complaint about, um, a state violation of a bit in human rights language, right? As part of their complaint. Um, where, you know, you see that, or you see this also, or you see economic stuff coming into say the SADC tribunal when that existed, um, a sort of mix of those same claims um, about expropriation being made in a human rights context. And then again, in a bit context. And then you also have actors such as um, international human rights organizations or, um, uh, I'd say the just sort of actors that are generally interested in supporting those views that then want to infuse them into various elements of international economic law because they view those regimes as more effective in terms of enforcement than anything that we have on the on the human rights side. Like where do you see that that coming from? Is it a combination? Um, which which actors are you most interested in? 
Well, I just focus, I, I didn't, uh, my research didn't go to the private uh, practice. I mostly focus on what, how uh, was the behavior of the international community as a, as a group. I look into the UN members and also the uh, GATT contracting parties and uh, how the, those were just uh, trying to connect or disconnect these, um, these two laws of of course, I, 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 uh, I, in my research, I noticed, if I can say that word, that uh, there was kind of bias. And also, um, for example, before the creation of the World Trade Organization, the U.S. put forward the, uh, in, in, a, in, in the preparatory uh, committee for the, uh, in, during the Uruguay round, uh, the U.S. put forward the talk about failed labor standards. And uh, developing countries, uh, mostly, of, uh, for example, led by Brazil or India, they said, no, we don't want labor standards in the, in the trade arena because we know that those labor standards can be used as a protectionist way for developed countries. So we don't want them. And then we can, well, now in, in current trade uh, uh, agreements, we can see back the, how these labor standards are coming. So it's it's not something new, and it, it's I think it will be unfair to say, oh, it was this country or the other country. So uh, it, my focus here is about uh, I'll say the whole how the whole international community has been behaving, and and sometimes I talk about a specific country, but just to. Um, to show what was the the, the meaning or, or the the feeling at that time from the, the a block of countries. Yeah, yeah, I, I keep uh, you know uh, wondering because it's a very interesting discussion. And I said I have uh, you know um, my own interest uh, in the nearby field. So. Uh, and uh, this is a half serious, but half uh, you know, choking question. Would you allow any other siblings in your system? How about, how about you know, international environmental law? Are they yes. Um, yes. You know, <laughs> something to be considered? And then of course you can go to sustainable development. So what would you say to that? Yes, we definitely need a, I think um, the international community, it's, uh, it's not just the siblings. It's like all families who used to have like 11 siblings and something like that. Yes, that definitely uh, there should all, um, I, I, well, I think that it should be is go back to the rules of our international order. What was the purpose and how well uh, other international law has been behaving in order to accomplish the main founding purpose. And, um, well, my research was narrowed into international human rights law and international trade, maybe because of my, my background. I'm, I'm a lawyer. I, I come from, a, from Mexico and I used to work in a trade law firm. So I had a first hand approach of uh, NAFTA deals and how that uh, impact in, in workers' rights. So I think that's why uh, I focus on trade and, and, and human rights law. But uh, for sure, there are many other siblings that should be involved in 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 in, in, the, in this issue well thank you and i also have a question i don't know maybe you can educate me here so um it strikes me that um it's for you know, um i don't know uh, so it strikes me that um, there are different levels of international law here right and so um in trade law we have multi party treaties, but we also have regional, you know, you mentioned NEFTA or new NEFTA. Uh, <laughs> and so you have free trade agreements, which are more, um, you know, um, with fewer countries uh, as their participants. And then for international human rights, it feels, and this is your way you can correct me, it feels that it's more reliant on multilateralism as opposed to bilateral treaties. So um, does this somehow impact your analysis or um, at least what you're observing and indicating is convergence? And so how to account for um, you know, this difference and how to reconcile those if this is a problem at all? Well, I, I think uh, I have never think about a bilateral treaty of, of human rights. That would be a, a main, like that would be something very interesting to look into that. 
for methodological reasons, and because this is a, a PhD program, I need to follow uh, methodology and I need to, to narrow my uh, research. So I didn't look into uh, regional agreements. For example, uh, I should have looked how uh, the um, Inter-American Court of Human Rights deal, deals with uh, these trade issues. I didn't do that. I just focus on the UN human rights system and uh, in the trade arena. But um, I think your your question is great and and yeah, it strikes me very very uh, something new that I will look to um, to look for it further later after my PhD maybe. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Alisa, you can be next. Um, sure. I so I have one more question for Anna, and um, it's a pretty simple one, um, which is you mentioned the COVID pandemic, and I know that this was probably happening as you're writing, so it's a little bit hard to put it in. But since you did invite the question, <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you talk about how your research relates to the response to COVID? Uh, this maybe also relates to Vera's last question about siblings, right? So health is sometimes put in the human rights context. Sometimes we think of that sort of as an, like environmental rights as sort of a separate area. Yes. Um... For sure, I was uh, writing my whole dissertation and, and suddenly as it happens in the whole world, a pandemic uh, came and, um, and I couldn't stop thinking about how was the response of, uh, of the governance uh, on, uh, before this uh, situation. And um, in my paper, I think Vera didn't have the chance to, to look into it, but I kind of a picture this uh, tragedy that happened with the Titanic, how they discovered that um, it was on fire before sailing and that how the metal of the boat was weakened in, in the same ex exact spot where, where the iceberg hit the, the boat and that was caused the, uh, the sinking of the Titanic. So then I started th thinking about our international order and how without uh, thinking about it, maybe our international order is on fire and it has been weakened in areas such as economic development and human rights protection that goes with the human right to health and how um, governments were equipped to uh, respond to this pandemic and how um, I, I was, uh, I'm gonna quote one of uh, the professors here at Queen's University, uh, Professor Kevin Banks wrote an amazing paper which says that uh, international law, um, the, the purpose of international law should to um, impact in the national legislation in order to be effective. So um, maybe the international order is not impacting on legislation, national legislation, because of this fire that was caused in, in, in the earliest uh, days when it was a uh, when these uh, international laws were created. So that's how I start thinking about this relationship between the pandemic and, and, and my research. Um, I see Sarah and um, Luz Miranda. Uh, do either of you have questions for our panelists? I know that it's a little bit disjointed because you came in after the main presentations. Um, I'm, I'm okay. I don't have any questions, but I'm I'm having such a great time listening to this really this discussion. I, I missed your presentations, but it's been fascinating all the same. Um, yeah, just so no no questions, but but thank you. <laughs> okay, at this point, I was going to ask um, Antonia if she wouldn't mind uh, turning off recording because we're going to workshop the papers a little bit. If that is okay with with everybody, of, you have quite, oh you might have questions for each other as well. Absolutely. No, I, I will stop uh, the recording and uh, I will let the discussion go on uh, with more insight uh, view on the papers. Thank you.